All right. Uh, hey, everyone. Um, so uh, today, David Karamgard is going to be presenting on uh, unlocking the power of multi-protocol messaging with Apache Pulsar. Uh, David is a committer on the Pulsar project and uh, has written a book on the topic. So yeah, welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so you already told about me what I'm going to be talking about, so let's get right into it. Got to hope this works. Nope. You buy a clicker and it doesn't work, first thing. There's something. Okay, so let's do it this way. So yeah, a little bit about me. So I'm a committer on the Apache Pulsar project. Uh, also, uh, author of Pulsar in Action. I've worked quite a quite a few places from A to Z, from Amazon to Zappos, and everywhere in between. I've been open source for God, a decade and a half now. I kind of hate to say that. Starting with Hadoop way back when. Uh, worked on a lot of different uh, com companies all over the world. Uh, um, had that opportunity again. I've, I've Written one, one book by myself, Pulsar in Action. It's available for free download. If you go to streamnative.io uh, resources uh, under ebooks, you can get the entire copy. So I encourage you, if you're interested in Pulsar, learn about that, get that resource. Uh, I was fortunate enough to contribute on Practical Hive on query optimization inside of Hive back in the day when everybody used Hive to query their data. So, so it's a little bit of what I'm going to talk about messaging systems in general and you know, how they evolved and, 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 and some of the problems with that. Talk about use cases and applications for uh, multi-protocol messaging. Like, why why is this a cool thing? Is it just a novelty, or is there an actual business application to this? Talk a little bit about how Pulsar solves this problem with our protocol handlers and how we uh, enable Apache Pulsar to speak different protocols, which is different from all other messaging systems. Uh, do a, hopefully a demonstration, and then talk about you know follow up questions and things like that. So hopefully the demonstration goes well on that. So let's talk about messaging protocols. Uh, the problem with messaging protocols is kind of like opinions. Everybody has one. Uh, they don't always line up with one another uh, sort of thing. And, that's, and so that's just one of the things that it's, it's a great thing. We're solving the same problem. We've built messaging systems that have been around since 1994, depending on who you ask. You know, IBM MQ came out and it's a way of sending data from point A to point B. So why do we have to reinvent this thing? And every time we reinvent it, we always manage to make a different messaging protocol along the way, because at their, at their core, messaging systems, including Apache Pulsar, is our client server applications at a very, very low level. We speak of, we spend a very low level primitive back and forth to say, send the data, receive the data, move your cursor here, move your cursor there, and everybody has their own unique implementation of that. And this way, these that this necessitates that these client libraries, each, each messaging system, whether it's a messaging broker, how we interact with these endpoints, require their own client library that speaks that version. It, it knows how to send these low level commands to publish data and receive data. So they become tightly coupled to one another, right? So uh, they're used as a primary way to move data back and forth between the information and they, you know, they have to use the same protocol, oftentimes even the same version. You can't have, you know, 2.1 of one protocol and 2.5 of the other. There's just misalignments and things like that don't work. So they're very, very tightly coupled uh, to one another. This, this sort of ends up to a uh, a proliferation of the fact that you have these messaging systems and each one has their own. You start building some applications on it uh, like this. You know, these things have all been developed, they, but they address different challenges, right? So the first one came out was IBM MQ it was built for business. Then you had, you know, things come along like AMQP was a standard. Then you had MQTT, which is good for low level sort of messaging communications. Then later on, things like, like Apache Kafka coming to be. And each one of these things are developed to address different challenges, right? Why not just reuse the same messaging system? Why are we reinventing the wheel? It's because these messaging systems solve different problems. Uh, and so these are just one of those things where you can, order, you know, again, having each one of them use their own protocol is sort of a, a, sort of, uh, a pain, in, pain in the neck. And it makes application interoperability very limited. If I want to send, if I want to have, I'm, have publishing data from one client or one application, I want to be able to consume it on the other. Now that client has to, that application has to use my client library to go get this data that's stored in a silo in this data messaging system, which becomes a bit of a problem. It ends up with something like this, right? If I want to, uh, have this data moving around. So I have these different applications, A, B, and C, all using different, uh, you know, protocols here, a RabbitMQ system. I have an MQTT library. I have a Kafka broker. These applications, if, you know, application D is publishing stuff to MQTT, I can't move that data over. Application B can't get it. There's no way laterally to get those sorts of things very easily. If it's in a topic somewhere. Why can't I just go get it uh, sort of thing? And same with, you know, app, app, same thing when anything's running in, in Kafka. Any Kafka application can't access this data because it's a different client library. I don't know how to communicate to MQTT and get this information. It'd be cool if I could, you know, analyze this information together. So a lot of these 
things build bridges or protocols. We had just said the last speaker just talked about, we have this cool library, but the first thing you do is plug it in and get Kafka to feed it into your system. Uh, now, what if you want to merge that, do some analytics on MQTT at the same time, right? You have to have a second client library under the covers and you're connecting the emerging these data sets together and blending them, these sorts of things on that, right? So it's, it's there's there's really no good solution for this. You could do something like, like this here where you have one application has multiple different client libraries. So if I have one copy of the data, I'll send I'll send a copy to MQTT. I'll send one to Kafka. I'll send one out to MQP. I have to know ahead of time who my consumers are. Uh, then you get this tight coupling of information, right? You have multiple application dependencies in this application D. And I've been importing three different client libraries. So I got to keep them all in sync. Uh, that's not a good solution. Uh, you have data duplication in that scenario. And you have still have multiple messaging systems maintained, right? Do I have to have the same copy of data in MQTT and RabbitMQ and Kafka over these things. Uh, and then the last but not least is you can't track who consumed your messages and when, right? Is there data lag, data latency? I have this message published over. I'm trying to sync up and communicate these things. It goes over a different messaging system. I lose visibility into who had that access, who consumed that message. If I need to resend it, things like that. All these, all these things get lost when you try and together these messaging systems that we all have, right? So you can have, there's some systems out there, you can do some automated replication processes. You can send, send something up that does a messaging bridge that just says, you know, you can write something like this or there's probably applications that exist that just say, hey, you know, just scan all these topics. When you see a new message come in here, I'm actually publish it over uh, as well. That's another different way to do it. But again, you know, you're depending on a separate process. This is a standalone process. It could go down, it could lag. All these other um, uh, DevOps overhead, uh, you know, introduced from having this type of, of solution. Uh, there's additional latency, uh, things like that. And then still, it doesn't solve the multiple messaging systems problem, right? You have, you have 3x the number of infrastructure to do basically the same solution of I'm sending data from point A to point B uh, sort of thing. And it's, you still have the data duplication problem, right? I have one, one message, three copies floating around, maybe more, depending on your messaging system. So really... Really, really a bad solution for like that. Really what you want is something like this. You want a single copy of the data. You want a single system to maintain. And you want to publish with any any protocol you choose and consume with any protocol you choose. So think of it like, you know, writing into uh, having this thing where it can bridge. You're writing into a database with any client library you want. I use a standard SQL command to get it out, right? I want one way to get the data out and a, and a unique way to get the data in. Uh, so think of it like that. Think of it as a way of having just a standard Protocol, I don't care. I can choose the, still the right messaging protocol I want for my particular use case, but simplify it into a single uh, desired system that does all my messaging from this point forward. And what are some of the benefits of that, right? So it's not just a not just a theoretical concept, right? There are things where you want to have interoperability between different systems, right? You have, in the real world, you have legacy systems. People came out and they, they adopted IBM MQ, they'd have uh, AMQP applications like that. And then you don't know what the future holds either. So you want to have a way that I say, when I publish these messages out, I know everybody will be able to get them. Or I want to bring these old applications into the fold so they get newer applications so they can share this protocol and publish their data and it can be liberated out and exposed to other systems, right? It's been sitting there forever. Uh, diverse use cases, right? It's these messaging systems and the protocols are designed for, for you know very unique use cases. The MQTT is great for what it does, AMQP is great for what it does. Don't make you choose one or the other. Pick, you know, pick and choose the one you want, and then let the infrastructure handle it behind the scenes. So you can support more use cases going forward uh, with this pattern. As you see, we have a protocol adapter. A new greatest messaging protocol along comes along. We're going to put in a protocol adapter. Speak that too. That's just sort of future proofing and supporting your use case. Uh, legacy systems. That's a big advantage, right? These people have these older. Again, I'm IBM Message Queue applications out there critical for running their business, uh, they cannot replace them, right? They're stuck in this legacy hardware. People don't want to support this software anymore. You don't get the new innovations with this. Let's bring these things into the 20, you know, 21st century. Let's not keep them stuck there in the 1990s, uh, try, to, try to keep their critical business application running. And then last but not least, simplified infrastructure, right? Everything into a single system. Uh, don't have a RabbitMQ team, don't have a Kafka team, don't have an MQTT team, have one team, one messaging system, Get the you know the synergies of having all that inf you know, infrastructure together scale up dynamically so you can store the data uh, just makes things a lot easier so what does this have to do with apache pulsar or what is apache pulsar so i work for stream native we're the company behind apache pulsar uh it's you know in a, it's it's a lot of things but one way to think of it what we think of it is it's really just an infinite event stream storage we have a protocol on top of it, but really it's just infinite stream storage, uh, horizontally scalable, decoupled compute and storage. So really 
abstracts away how you store data. You can offload the data, read it natively, uh, keep it forever, that sort of thing. And our basic model of storing the data within Pulsar is just a topic, right? You have multiple producers, multiple consumers. You push data in. It's an ordered sequence of events. It can grow infinitely. Uh, again, it's an unbounded storage system uh, that we happen to uh, do. We do what's called segment-based storage, and I won't get into that too much. It's different from partitioning uh, in that it's sort of dynamic. It can scale um, as you as you add data, right? So if you're familiar with the Kafka system, first thing you have to do is pick the number of partitions you have. So the basic you know, data structure behind Kafka is an abstract log. It's a very, very big log. And the first thing you do is say, I have a topic. Uh, it's going to be a log. I'm going to chop it up to, into n number of pieces. Those are partitions. And you have to guess ahead of time. How can you possibly know? And no matter what number you guess is always wrong. So we, chose, we decided differently. We're just going to have segments. And what that means is, so think of it like you have data, go back to data structures and you have a programming language. A partition is like having an array and you have to decide like my, my array is going to have index of 10. That's it. I have 10 spots to put my data. What segment base does is it's a length list. You can add as many things as you want. We need another segment. You just add another one and it's a pointer to that. And that allows us to grow infinitely and to have the infinite, infinite stream storage that I talked about. That's it at a very high level. Uh, lots of talks about me and, from me and other people on this concept. So we have this infinite stream storage. Topic is our main uh uh, you know, basic data structure that you store data into. Everything's a topic. Consumers and producers talk to them. So then what we did was lay on top of this is a messaging protocol, which is just a thin layer on top of this infinite stream storage. We have some benefits we've added that we think differentiate from other messaging systems. I won't get into that here. That's not the point of this talk. But just to say that we really structure first is this infinite stream storage. How you talk to it is a secondary concern. How do I push data in out of this topic uh, is really a secondary thing to that. So that's how we Think of it, and then we sort of expanded that concept, right? So we think of it like this. The broker, these are our brokers here, the blue. Uh, I don't know if you can read that. I apologize in the back. Uh, that's that's our that's our server layer. That's that's the serving layer. That's the data compute. And the yellow boxes, there are bookies. That's our infinite stream storage there. So what, and then Zookeeper, which is being replaced. Uh, that's an older slide. We have a open source thing called Oxy, which scales, solve the, solves the Zookeeper problem uh, once and for all, horizontally scalable storage, but we won't, won't get into that. Uh, handles that. So what happens is the broker serves the topic. Brokers are assigned to that. And then these protocol handlers are what allow you to speak to the different uh, producers and consumers. So this is the traditional model of, hey, I'm a client server. Uh, the brokers implement the client part of it. And then we have this protocol handler, which is uniquely designed for Pulsar. Initially, you have your different, uh, your Pulsar client libraries and you have consumers that use the same Pulsar library and they send data back and forth, right? And the data comes in and you get it from all these different sources and that's like that. So that's our basic model. We had that in place. That's what every messaging system did, including us. We're all original, uh, are all guilty of that same sort of design flaw. So then we thought about it and said, how do we get this thing to support different messaging protocols? We got this cream storage. It's really just a thin layer on top. Can we write our own thin layers or different layers to make it such that we, uh, you know, really do that? And really, let's just treat every messaging protocol as a thin layer on top of our stream storage. Uh, we think of the we think of the best solution for stream storage. It scales infinitely. All these different things, faster performance, these things. Uh, now let's work backwards. The problem backwards and instead of forcing everybody to speak Pulsar. Now, hey, we got this great thing. Change your programming language. Move your you know everything over. We said let's 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 build a bridge backwards and build these protocol handlers that will speak these languages. Everybody already has the applications in. And so what we really did was just you know we have the Pulsar proto protocol handler. That's a concept we still have. And we said let's just make this more generic. Let's just add these protocol handlers in here that know how to interact with the with our storage system to publish and consume data uh, and speak. And rather than reinvent these client libraries, we just we just adapt to them, right? So this the green up box indicates that it's really just dynamic, and we have Kafka, AMQP, MQTT. Uh, things can be added later on, but again, it's an extendable, pluggable framework. Speak whatever language you want, and hopefully, if the demo works, uh, you'll be able to see Pulsar. I have one Pulsar cluster today speaking all five protocols. So everything will work. It's just, you know, it's no smoke or mirrors, single box, that sort of thing. So our first suite was just sort of historically where we've been, how we've gone is we've done the, we call it on Pulsar. So we do star on Pulsar. Uh, first one was KOP, Kafka on Pulsar that came out here, open source 2020. And we've since moved on to June, added AMQP on Pulsar, and that's version 0 0.9 for those of you who are sticklers on protocol versions, not 1.0, uh, 0 0.9 works. Uh, and then we've added MQTT on Pulsar called MOP on Pulsar. As well, and then in the future, you know, the future holds whatever the future holds, sort of thing. We can speak these protocols uh, quite well. 
it's a little background on the AMQP. Uh, that's that's what it's called. It was a standard application layer, so it's more of a standard than an actual um, physical implementation. But it has some very you know unique semantics. Uh, it was designed on queuing and routing, so it was true pub sub. Uh, thing was I think developed at J.P. Morgan Chase originally. And then became widely adopted. It said, hey, we got this thing to exchange business information. We're sending money back and forth. Let's have a standard way with guaranteed, guaranteed receipt, you know, reliable publish and subscribe, all these different security things built in. Everybody loves it. There's hundreds of applications built on it. Uh, it's been there forever. It's going to continue to be there for some time. They have these unique concepts where they have, you know, these different messaging queues, and then they have replicators and routers and exchanges set in. So it's a little more. Uh, it, there's some concepts we had to map to Pulsar to handle these sorts of things, but we handle these quite well. So this is the basic, those of you who worked with AMQP are familiar with the concept of exchanges. Exchanges can map to different queues dynamically and allows it to scale out dynamically and handle these sorts of things. So we took that and implemented it. Again, following what we talked about as a protocol handler, we had the first one was the AMQP protocol handler added it here. This one also supports a proxy, which we'll talk about a little bit. Some do and some don't. These protocols, I'll get into that in a bit, why we can and can't do it. And then you, that way you can speak RabbitMQ, right? So you have an application that uses a RabbitMQ library, you have an existing one, you can just change the URL, say, speak to this AMQP uh, endpoint, and now you're using Apache Pulsar. And this gives you the infinite stream storage that you wanted, plus the pub subscribe semantics you want it. So it's horizontally scalable things. RabbitMQ is great, AMQP, AMQP is great, but it was designed in 2004. So it was designed to run on a single system, not a horizontally distributed system. The horizontal, the distributed system revolution was kind of started with Hadoop, and that's around, you know, 2009, 2010, depending on who you ask, <laughs> when the code came out. But then everything became, then we could distribute everything. Databases, messaging systems, everything became horizontally scalable. AMQP and these other systems got left behind, so they don't have the scalability. Now you can sort of take advantage of that with this particular framework on that. So we're able, in this particular protocol, to add, uh, it's an optional uh, component added on top. It extends, extends it to multiple uh, device so you can scale it horizontally, you know, forwards the messages on, it keeps track of what your virtual host and those exchanges, it handles all that mapping under the covers. So we know if you connect to a client, you connect to this proxy, hey, you really going over to, you know, broker one, two, three, or four uh, in our horizontal system on uh, an increase of scalability. So that's something we can add there. Uh, and it really just handles that regardless of uh, topic assignment, basically um, Pulsar, like other distributed message system topics can move around. It can be assigned to broker one, it's not pinned there forever, the data can move. And so if a, if a broker goes down or becomes hotspot, at least in Pulsar, we'll move it to another topic, another broker, and this will track that for you as well. So your data doesn't get pinned to one particular broker and the proxy is aware of that. And we speak that. Uh, MQTT came along as a lightweight published describe. It's used in a lot of you know edge cases, IoT, lots of talks about IoT. I wanna gather sensor data, uh, quality service uh, impacts came into place that evolved differently. It's great for remote devices, you know, with small folk, you know, you put it in embedded devices, I'm measuring sensors, things like that, out on the edge, sensors out for, you know, oil and gas, machine, you know, you know, factory, industrial, IoT, things like that. Uh, and it's really, you know, low overhead, low, you know, low power consumption is the key to this and very reliable death messaging. So that's another protocol that exists, used for newer things, you know, different use cases in AM, AMQP, MQTT exists for reasons, so we speak that. Uh, almost an identical uh, slide here showing that instead now you can just plug in the MQT protocol handler. Again, it maps to a Pulsar topic. That did the topic can be stored at infinite stream storage. And it also supports a proxy uh, as well. So again, you can have these MQTT libraries out there publishing data to Pulsar. They don't know that it's a Pulsar topic. It go over TCP, goes over the MQTT network, over these uh, transport protocols, just comes right into Pulsar. Similar thing, we have a proxy in front. So you don't have to worry about, you know, reliability of the Pulsar brokers behind the scene. Your topic could be on one, broker goes down. You don't have to be aware of that. Uh, the proxy will automatically map you over to the other broker. Whatever happens, reconnects them, monitors that again, regardless of, of topic assignment. That's something that's automatically handled by that proxy. Uh, last but not least, so the Kafka protocol, Kafka came along slightly different. Uh, it built its own transport protocol like, like we did. It has its own message, way of sending things. Super popular, widely adopted across multiple industries. A lot of people wrote applications on that, K streams, K tables, all these different things, doing stream analytics, everybody has these sorts of things. So we decided to write KOP as well to make it easier to port these applications over. You have an existing uh, K streams application, you put in KOP protocol handler like here. Uh, now, you're, now you can just talk directly to Pulsar, no changes required. Uh, notice that there's not a proxy here between the two. I know we're gonna 
I don't know what my time limit is, but I want to make sure I have time for the demo. Difference being that there's no proxy here. And one of those reasons why, in a nutshell, is because of the, the group coordinator uh, offsets problem and the way that the Kafka clients coordinate amongst themselves, right? So that it is designed for parallel consumption. You join a consumer group. So again, in Kafka, you have five partitions. You create a consumer group. You have five or six uh, clients in there, let's say, one standby and you know, standby, but they all are consuming from different partitions. They have to, they sync back by writing to the same uh, information back to another topic. It's hard to track that information. So doing this at the proxy level is very hard. Uh, all these different reasons why it's done uh, on a per partition basis, offsets manage it, management's done there. We can't keep track of that as much. So a proxy isn't something that we do uh, in that particular particular case. And just for the sake of variety, you don't, to, don't have to use a protocol handler. So I'm gonna show JMS as well in JMS. Uh, there was a Starlight for JMS implementation. I don't see, they were here. There's some of the contributors here at the conference. I saw them as well. This is just a drop-in library. So you don't need to have a protocol handler for this. It can speak JMS uh, just as a pluck, just as a drop-in, put in the library in there. Uh, no protocol handlers required. So we speak all these different ways. Uh, and that way you can have these uh, different protocols handling. So now uh, I'm going to attempt the demo demonstration guides and the speaker guides and try to have a demonstration here live of the application itself and walk you through the code. This is what I hope to do. Uh, so if it doesn't happen, uh, definitely could follow up with that. I shared the GitHub link here. All the stuff is in there. Uh, I'm going to walk you through the exact code as I have it, the latest version. I'm going to start Pulsar up so it's just a standalone instance running on my uh, laptop. I'm going to start different microservices, all publishing these three, Pulsar, Kafka, and JMS, to a single topic. Uh, and then you'll start seeing them, receive the messages from one another, uh, that sort of thing. And then if I have time, I'll try and do AMQP and MQTT as well, uh, publishing to a different topic because they don't replicate quite as well, just to show you that it speaks all five languages. With that, So with that, let me go out here. Where is my? Hard to see your mouse on a completely different screen over there. So share this over here. This is going to be, I didn't anticipate having to type like this. <laughs> let me, let me start it here and then we'll do this command. So let's go back here. So the first command I'm running is you go into that pack package here, you have these shell scripts that start up your Docker Compose. So I'll share the code here in my IntelliJ. So everything I'm running is inside this bin folder. There's things to start the persistence layer, then you start the broker layer, and I'm running through those steps now. It's really hard to do this sideways. I apologize. So now that stuff, it's uh, waiting for, looks like Zookeeper to come up and running and initializing the cluster. I wish I'd done this before. Okay, there we go. Now I'm going to start the brokers. That doesn't take as long. And then I'm going to... Hopefully, brokers are up and running. I don't wait for that to come back. So I'm going to try and set some retention policies. This is necessary for the uh, AMQP. So underneath the covers I'm doing, I can actually show you the code. I'm setting some namespaces. I'm setting, I'm creating a virtual host that's required for the exchanges in AMQP. Uh, and then set them some data retention policies on that so the data doesn't immediately get dropped. So in, in Pulsar, if you don't have a consumer, the data gets dropped. It only keeps data around. Uh, if there's an active subscription, somebody's waiting for the messages. Otherwise, you have to set a retention policy. So that's what these two scripts are going to do. Where did I go here? Hopefully, this one works now. While that thing is running, I'm going to start up some of these microservices here. So, right, so this guy is running now. The moment of truth. Let's make sure everything's running. Pulsars. I don't know what I put. Let's think in a minute, setting those policies. While we're waiting for that, which is not independent, I will. So in each one of these, as you can see, the structure of the code is there's a separate microservice with a particular protocol. What it does is build Docker locally in an image, deploys it, runs as its own microservice, so they're not running the same application. So we'll start with this uh, 
Pulsar, remember, doesn't have Pulsar talking to Pulsar. And there's nothing really interesting going on here, but just to show that it's going to start up and run. Uh, I have this thing running while we're going here. Pulls down the latest code, employs it as an image. Uh, it'll just start talking to itself is what we'll see here shortly. Pull this guy down. Yep, so I use different little logos so you visually can see them. This one's a unicorn. I'm Pulsar. I'm talking to Pulsar. So let's start up a second one now. So start up a second. So now I'm going to run one with just a Kafka microservice. Does the same thing. It's going to build the code in here. Uh, run it. And it'll start publishing its own messages to the same topic. So we can visually put these things over here. And then just to show the code, it's using the exact same. Uh, so I use, use the Spring library. I cheated. I don't want to write a lot of code. Uh, public default multi-protocol. This is the same one being used for, for Pulsar. So there you go. And now, now they're starting to see both, right? So now Kafka's joined the party. It's going to make me a liar because yesterday it worked. This one's getting both. Uh, I'm using Kafka. I'm using Pulsar. Of course, it doesn't work. One of these things that should definitely work with one of these. So this one's speaking, getting both of those protocols in there. Uh, let's, let's add a third one to the party now. Bring it over here. I can see where I'm typing really quick. That back now we're just trying to speak JMS. So when went in microservice JMS running that microservice as well. It's going to come in and talk to the same. Uh, there it is. So this one's getting JMS. This one is getting the JMS messages. It's also getting the Pulsar messages. Up as well. And then this guy's getting all of them as well. So there you're getting. With the exception of the Pulsar one, which is embarrassing, but I swear to God, it worked <laughs> an hour ago. Uh, they're all they're, they're getting three way messaging. I, it'll work if maybe if I restart it or something with a cursor uh, like that. But there you can see one message is three different messaging protocols, all settings exchanging messages on the same topic. This is just one use case. You could have one published one, none to another. This gives an example sort of, of, of what they're able to do and publishes this information. So, being a glutton for punishment, having gotten mostly successful, let's just continue pushing our luck. Here and have one now. Show uh, I just want to show something with. I'm not really want to remotely do that. I think it's a little challenge with window space here. So let me pull this guy somewhere where it won't try and become its own merge with another window. Bring it over here. Now let's do one for AMQP. Again, we have the one for AMQP. This one is not going to publish to the same communal one. I'm going to publish to a slightly different one just to. Just to uh, show that it speaks AMQP. Protocol. This one. Microservice. Microservice. This one's going to publish to a different topic, but it's going to show that this one's going to speak AMQP. Here as well. Just to show they can all speak to that as well. And then while we're waiting, I'll start a MQTT just for completeness to show you that all of these messaging protocols are supported. So this guy over here. Track of lost track where I am here, a little confusing. So, this is AMQP. I put a little rabbit icon for RabbitMQ. It's speaking to it's talking to itself, talking to Pulsar. This should show you that's out there. Then we'll run an MQTT one just to show you that they all run all simultaneously, no switches, no anything, just some configuration. 
to get this up and running. Again, the code is just using uh, the spring libraries and the default messaging libraries and bringing their respective client libraries. Uh, yep, so I'm this one here, I'm sort of listening in on the AMQP and the MQTT, you know, sort of jumping in on that one, getting the messages as well, jumping in at that point in time. So we've got all these different ones running. And again, the code is available. Let's track it where my code is, this cluster. 60 is just running, doing its thing. JMS, AMQP, all of these things, all running. Different code, very, very simple, you know, code. Very simple, easy to understand. Send the data every so second, I send the data back, increment, increment the counters, that's it. So very, very simple demo on that. So now let's go back to this guy. We'll leave these running in the background. And of course, we're way behind. Keep track of that. So almost to the end. So that, that's what I did. Again, started the image, talked Docker Compose, microservices, each one of them, independent libraries, speaking five different protocols, all sharing messages across topics uh, on that. So just to summarize what I said, why, why I think this is important, hopefully you got something out of this is, you know, messaging systems were originally designed to have different protocol systems because they're client server, they're tightly coupled, they couldn't really speak to one another. And so you get these silos, these data silos, these messaging silos, uh, and all these different applications. You have the same infrastructure doing the same thing to basically send messages from point A to point B. Uh, but there are different messaging protocols that are designed for great use cases. So don't throw them away. We're not saying throw them away. We're saying embrace them and put them into a single platform. Uh, with that. And so, and a lot of these systems have legacy messaging systems they would love to migrate off. Uh, so speaking these protocol systems, but bringing them into a newer modernized messaging infrastructure is, is the way forward. And we think these protocol handlers uh, do that. And then, you know, this protocol, these protocol handlers just provide an abstraction over the, you know, infinite stream storage. Uh, and you can speak different uh, languages as well. So what we think is you can use Pulsar to publish and consume messages at scale from anywhere using any protocol and any programming language you want. Uh, it's sort of the final solution, you know, like SQL is to databases. We think these protocol handlers and made Pulsar similar to you have a standard way of speaking. You can speak your own language, but you store the data in a single repository. You know how to get back using your particular library of choice. Uh, that's it. These are the details on me. Let's keep in touch. LinkedIn, GitHub. Uh, we'll get you all that information. Uh, and that's it. Questions? Yes. So JMS is a specification on how the messages must be uh, handled, where AMQP is actually the wired, wired protocol. And JMS can run on AMQP, for example. That's why we can do it as a client library. There's no translation layer required there. It can actually, we, we simulate, we map the JMQ protocol to Pulsar directly and then read the messages back out. That's why we're able to do it as a client library versus a protocol. Yes. Uh, since we use Pulsar under the hood for every protocol, uh, is there any performance concern that we could work? Not. Not that I'm aware of, there, so we can definitely benchmark these different protocols. And we have, uh, I worked at a company that created the, what's called Open Messaging Benchmark. Uh, that's an open source project. You can download it, spins up infrastructure on cloud providers, the same infrastructure, runs the same different workloads, you know, X amount of topics, X amount of producers, and get those metrics. We have not really seen any degraded performance on that. You're getting, once it gets to Pulsar, it's the same performance at that point. So any performance penalties are going to be due to the client library itself and not so much the end system is, is, is what we've typically seen. Yeah, there's a question here. I have a question about the Kafka on Pulsar. Mm -hmm. uh, so you said like, it does not support a proxy. Does it mean like, we're not able to use the traditional Kafka way to set up the partition or the object uh, to that uh, based on Pulsar, or we have to use the Pulsar's way to deal with the partition? Yeah, that's a great question. So, yeah, I, I first two I did not apologize. So the question was with with KOP, the Kafka on Pulsar, does it has some limitations with regard to par partitioning and the lack of a proxy? Why we why Pulsar can't do that? So the short answer is you do not have to do that same partitioning, but the way that the consumer groups track the position in of the consumption is handled on the client side in Kafka, which is different than how Pulsar does it. And so they tend to publish back to a known location. They used to use Kafka. They since came to their senses and published it to a durable topic instead.
but that topic itself is assumed to be in the Kafka protocol on the broker that you started with, right? Because you're tied to that particular broker. So if I'm going to partition one, it's broker three, broker three forever. Uh, and then it assumes these sorts of things. So proxy, our proxy layer is there to handle the fact that our, with Pulsar itself, they're not, the storage and computer separate. So broker three, partition three can move. It can teleport in time to where it needs to be. And then when that happens, that makes it difficult for the traditional Kafka protocol to handle that and put it in a proxy to track that information. So you can keep your, keep your data structure as you designed it, but you can't get the benefits of a proxy that allows you to go to a single point and say, this is, this is my cluster and under the covers hand, you, you still have to go back and know the individual brokers that you're going to. That's, and that's just the nature of that protocol itself. We can't really fix the way that that, that was done. So, but that's a great question. Yeah. Yes. Does KOP support uh, exactly one spin and some of the uh, uh, transactions? So the question was, does KOP support transactions as supported with uh, Kafka? Currently, no, there's a bug. There's a known bug with that. Uh, Pulsar has its own own uh, transaction mechanism and making it line up with the Kafka one is is sort of the disconnect and we're working on that. Uh, so even, even though we have it, it's just not a one-to-one -one mapping. So, but we're aware of that. We're fixing that issue. That's a great question. Yeah. Any other um, so I mean, if that, so uh, in what you can, you call them, in which you can, you can't have What are the types you can have them? Yeah, so the, so the question was, um, which other different use cases to use Apache Pulsar versus Apache Kafka, and what are some of those uh, use cases? So I would say definitely um, for if you have published in sub, pub sub semantics, if you really had new traditional queuing, like a work queue or some, something like that, Pulsar natively supports those semantics out of the gate. Our subscription type called shared subscription will do exactly what you would want, like a, a work queue. Uh, Kafka has not done that yet. They just announced that there's some of that they're adding that feature coming soon. I'm not sure what the, what the timeline on, is on that, but they finally, after dancing around that issue, admitted that queuing and work queues aren't exactly, you know, Pulsar is, or Kafka is designed for event streaming. It's great for store a lot of data here, re write it once, read it many times, do analytics on it, uh, you know, do the windowing, that sort of thing on top of that. Pulsar supports that as well, because we are infinitely stored as well, but we also support pub sub and things like that. And so I would say everything you can do with coffee, you can do with Pulsar, but uh, not vice versa yet. And the pub sub is one of the, one of those cases for sure. And multi-tenancy and things like that are some other features. Yes, sir. What is the retention policy for Pulsar? Like, you can configure that, or for uh, long it can be configured to retain They retain I mean, to keep the data if there's, for example, uh, for some time there's no configure, like a customer crash or something, mm -hmm. not going to make it stop that. Yep. So the question was what are the retention policy limitations or retention policies for data on Pulsar? Uh, Right now, there is none. The default out of the box is if you don't have an active subscription, then all the data d is not retained. Uh, as long as there's an active subscription, we'll keep all that data regardless of how long that is. So somebody advertised, I'm going to come back at some point in time on this subscription and get the data. We will keep that data. Now, you can also then set retention policies, which say, I want to keep this data, whether there's a, a subscriber or not, for X amount of time. And you can specify by time. And you specify by size and the first one went so like 500 gigs or three days uh, but there's really no limitation on that and just adding to that the fact that we can do tiered store storage offloading automatically makes that really effective so systems like kafka where you store it on disk or ampp you store it on the disk on that broker there's a physical limitation of how long you can do that now with the other systems say you can do tiered storage offloading but you can you can you can take any data and move it to s3 right but when you bring it back to a single serving layer, you have to rehydrate it and put it on brokers somewhere to serve that data, right? I can spin up a new broker in Kafka, but with no data on it, it can't serve data. Now there's a, there's a, so that setup cost is there with, with Pulsar, since it's decoupled, uh, what we have is a, uh, a topic is just a list of pointers. As I mentioned before, those are our segments. Where those segments list is just a URL, whether it's in our bookkeeper layer, which is a URL or S3 or your uh, and you know your NFS server does not matter to us. We know how to read that data, go get it and pull it back. So you can, you know, we say, you know, infinite, and I really made that claim. It's infinite to the point that you, you know, 
that you can store this data uh, used to be limited by what we called uh, the, the, the amount that metadata is stored somewhere. It used to be Zookeeper. We've since solved that problem with something called Oxia, which is now a truly horizontally scalable uh, metadata system. Uh, it's it's different than KRAF that came out. KRAF is re just really a re-implementation re of the Paxos algorithm. Uh, and it still stores data on disk, on local disk. And so you're limited on the volume of size on that. And I'm going to talk about that when we get into that. So long story short, you can keep data forever, basically. 